Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. I've been excited for weeks to do this panel. I gave my mustache a special waxing this morning. Um, just in anticipation, I say good morning. I think it's good morning. I'm not sure it's more. Um, yes, it's morning. Perfect. I'm still adjusting to time zones. Um, we are going to have a great panel to dive in on hybrid threats, um, as Alex just introduced. Um, she already mentioned the panel. I'm not going to dive more into the biographies, but please do check um, in the TSD magazine that you got. The backgrounds of this panel are just incredible from different regions, different perspectives, and different ways of thinking about the hybrid threat. Um, I also want to recommend one of, the, uh, one of the documents that's outside, if you go to the ASPE booth out here, they have this great document um, on the hybrid threat called Countering the Hydra, um, which dives in. It more precisely describes hybrid threats as a mix of military and non-military, covert and overt activities by state and non-state actors that occur below the line of conventional warfare. And they really hit that. It's, it's, it's the same activities as when we think about operating in the gray zone. And I'm not the first one to bring this up, um, but uh, anyone know, where, is, where does insurgent, I'm sorry, where does hybrid threats come from? Like what was the first adorable insurgent group that started um, uh, hybrid threats? No, guess, uh, yes, children, of course, because um, whether we set them implicit or explicit red lines, those little bundles of joy will figure out just how much they can try and get to under those red lines without having mom and dad go kinetic. Um, and so this is what we've seen. I'm really curious as an American to be here and to understand these different regional perspectives. But it really strikes me what Dr. Schmidt started off with. Because he said we have to have precise problems and solve them well. And so I would like as we, as we kick off, since we have these very different perspectives on the panel, to help bridge the gap, to get into what does hybrid threats mean, and especially in our first round, first set of questions, to be very specific about what we mean. Right, not at this, this very high level, like the, de the, the definition of countering the hy hydra, but the who, where, what, and how, specifically, of these hybrid threats. And Minister, if we can, if we can start with you. And good morning, and uh, thanks for having me for the second year in a row. Last year, my incarnation was um, NATO. This year, it's James, who is here, so you get two in one. And welcome back to the region. Thank you so much. I'm also here because Australia is important, not only to NATO, but also to Latvia, to the EU. Uh, it's one of the most like-minded states over a number of issues. And uh, I will be seeing the foreign minister tomorrow. Uh, today I'm seeing quite a number of officials here. So this deepening of the relationship is important for us, also in terms of understanding the threats. They might not be identical, but they actually are needed to be assessed regularly. So this is one of the tasks here for us um, in Latvia, in NATO, in the EU. The Russian war in Ukraine, obviously, more than two years going on, is still something that we prioritize across the board. And that is no exclusion with regard to discussing threats. Uh, when we discuss hybrid threats, very clearly the Russian concept, we need to be very clear what we are talking about. The Russian concept of conventional, unconventional is part of the same military toolbox. There is no real difference mm -hmm. how Russia implements its concept. So what we are seeing in Ukraine is exactly that. The preparation stage for the war was mostly unconventional, trying to capture the elites, the subversion, the, the information operations, fragmentation of political elites, and then the conventional war that started the brutal aggression. And now we are seeing the same being implemented again and again. So understanding that Russian military toolbox where both the conventional and unconventional is employed in stages, whether the preparation or, or uh, in, in undermining the uh, elites, capturing the elites and, and running disinformation operations using various technological means, using uh, very 
old corruption methods and so on and so forth is something that I think for all the countries here actually is important to understand because when Russia says that uh, it regards the EU, NATO or Australia or other countries as hostile nations to it, we can be quite sure yeah. that there is a full spectrum of means being implemented. It's a tough example with, with Ukraine because it was both a substitute for more violent kinds of conflict, but also, as you said, a prelude to it. And if we, and it, 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 it makes it difficult for us to respond to, right? If we know this is a prelude, then, it, it, then we have to respond in particular ways. If it's a substitute, we have to respond in other ways. So that's a very difficult aspect. Depends on the military objectives. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is why, again, not separating too much conventional and conventional, but understanding that it's part of the same uh, method is important. And in Ukraine, we have seen the unsuccessful attempt of the coup. Mm -hmm. We have seen violence employed internally, uh, trying mm -hmm. to uh, get uh, activists and groups to attack. Uh, we have seen corruption, we have seen targeting of particular activists, uh, we have seen the largest scale attacks we have seen today, but we have also seen uh, the use of technology, successful use of technology on the Ukrainian side, whether we speak, we had the discussion on the AI and drones and the military use, we will dive into it, I'm sure, later. But uh, there, is, there is a full spectrum of conventional and unconventional going on. Mm -hmm. So for us, again, within the NATO, and James will speak about it, we take it very seriously. Different yeah. countries have different concepts, how they use it. But, but uh, understanding that concept of those particular countries is very important. And for us, as in NATO, as in the EU, Russia is officially defined as a threat. So mm -hmm. we take it seriously. Terrorism is the most significant asymmetric threat. Uh, yeah. And again, uh, it, it's across all spectrums. So yeah. it's important to use our instruments of power to counter yeah. it. And it's something I might like to come, come back to. And, and we're going to try and go to um, questions here in about 15, 20 minutes, give us a little bit more time to make this indeed a dialogue. Something I might want to come back to as, as we're going is uh, I find on cyber, because I, I, I've tended to be on the cyber side, is I have many colleagues that say, well, cyber capabilities are only used as, um, as part of an intelligence contest. Right, there's a limit and states are unwilling or maybe the cyber doesn't even let you go past um, really just information advantage in stealing and, and destroying information, but not really more than that. And I'm concerned that that was a relic of the post-Cold War era where most of these cyber operations happened. And now that states are seeking more risk, right, great power competition, there's a land war in Europe um, that states might be using cyber and other hybrid means in much riskier ways. I guess maybe we're seeing this in the South China Sea right now with, with Chinese Coast Guard vessels. Um, uh, General, um, back to the, the original question, and as we're getting specific, from, from your perspective, General, how do, how do you, how do you think um, um, hybrid threats? Thank Sir. you, Jason, and uh, good morning, everyone. Great to be back in Sydney. Uh, last five years, I was in the Prime Minister's office, and we have a strategic dialogue with the Australians and part of the Quad. I've been coming here pretty often. Uh, coming to your question, let me uh, give you the, uh, the Indo-Pacific view, or rather the Asian view of uh, hybrid, rather than mm -hmm. the EU. And uh, what you said about a mixture of contact and non-contact and keep it, it sub-conventional, I think whatever vector one can think of in hybrid warfare, is being faced by us. And I'm talking from the Indian standpoint. Uh, we have these two uh, neighbors on our north and our west. And uh, let me take uh, the example of our neighbor on the north, China. So uh, you talk of uh, regular troops. Uh, we've had this incident in June 2020. We lost 20 soldiers. Uh, the Chinese tried to change the status quo of our uh, line of control. We've had these small skirmishes in some other places in the border, in Doklam and various other places. Uh, you talk of irregular troops being used. We've had these cases of proxy war in some of our states in the Northeast uh, uh, being used. 
Uh, you talk of uh, economic warfare. Uh, uh, the Chinese have made uh, you know, predatory pricing investments. Uh, fortunately, at the time 5G was coming, uh, we uh, came to know as to what is the grand plan and uh, so we came out with a directive for trusted sources and trusted uh, systems that we will only procure uh, trusted sources and trusted products in a telecom sector. And that is something that uh, we managed to keep their systems out because uh, the cost of data and the cost of intelligence is something that was hidden which was not known. Uh, when you talk of economic warfare, uh, you know, we have uh, these uh, nations all around us and Sri Lanka learnt it the hard way when uh, their port, uh, you know, that uh, Ambantota port was made and they fell into a debt trap. Uh, Maldives has learnt it. There have been some uh, uh, colour revolutions, uh, latest being in Bangladesh. So all around us, this uh, string of pearls, as uh, it is called, uh, that strategy is there. So uh, you talk of cyber warfare. Uh, we are probably one of the most cyber attacked countries in the world. The mm -hmm. global average is about uh, 2,000 per week. We have uh, 4,000 cyber attacks uh, reported every day, uh, every week. And I'm talking of attacks in the critical infrastructure. So we've had uh, you know, our power going down in Mumbai and our ports being attacked and our hospitals being attacked. So uh, information warfare, disinformation, mm -hmm. Cartographic warfare, you know, they have this technique of building border villages, mm -hmm. uh, changing names of places around. So whatever vector you can think of in hybrid warfare has been applied to us. Mm. And that is where I come from. Yeah. And this is, this is exciting to me because I could imagine from being outside of the region and being in, you know, the Washington, D.C., United States bubble, of imagining that we have different ideas of hybrid warfare and hybrid threats um, but this is very similar for what you had to the minister, right? Where, I mean, a different, a different adversary. Um, it also, I, I like it because sometimes we can get caught up in hybrid warfare and we get off all on the, the, the sexy technical side of it, right? And, and I'm sure we will, you know, we'll talk about AI perhaps or drones in this, um, in this panel or your questions, but I really like that you brought it back down to string of pearls and economic warfare, right? I mean, which is centuries old, right? Especially in this region, right? Going, going back even to the Portuguese, I guess, or the, or the Dutch <laughs> and the English um, and going through. So thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, sir, you've, you've had this great introduction. Um, uh, how do you do it? So again, let's, if we can be specific, is there, uh, how might you like to add to this? Sure, so uh, first, it, it's great to be here. It's also great to go uh, on a panel after uh, a discussion of AI, because usually when we talk at NATO, it depresses the whole audience. But after that conversation, anything <laughs> we say is going to sound better uh, and more cheerful. Um, yes, 20% chance, existential yeah, at least death, not gonna and now James. actually destroy the world in three years. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's good. Um, so. I'd say it's actually relatively simple. Uh, first is that we don't want, I think, in NATO anyway, to get too caught up in definitions because there's a mm -hmm. risk of Perfect. analysis paralysis mm -hmm. uh, or that when you don't want to do something, you just spend all your time analyzing and debating over, over categories. But bottom line, it looks something like the coordinated use by a state actor or potentially a non-state actor, but mm -hmm. in most cases, I think for all of us, it's principally a state actor, of a range of tools like cyber attacks, political interference, disinformation, uh, threats to critical infrastructure, including critical undersea infrastructure, forced migration, as the Russians, mm -hmm. for example, have pushed people across the border, in some cases, GPS jamming. We have, a, we have a list. You can go to the NATO declaration in Washington. There's a clear list. We function off that list. Uh, second thing I'd say is I think the distinction between below the threshold and the threshold of armed conflict is an artificial one. Uh, mm. Because as you quite rightly said, the Ukrainians are experiencing the full spectrum uh, of it uh, now. So it's not that they stop doing hybrid once the war starts. Right. And I think that that's actually important to note because sometimes in our exercises, we exercise oh. hybrid and then the war starts and we seem to forget all these other things uh, that are happening. But they will happen during war. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you an example which I've used a couple of times, but I was in a port talking to a CEO in, uh, 
in Europe. And at the time that I was in his office, he was uh, communicating with the CEO of another major port, a port which would receive NATO forces. And there was an ongoing cyber fight between that port's cyber defenders and a major state actor that was trying, because there was one of our warships in the port, to lock the two locks, drain the water, and drop the ship. Oh my gosh. And so this CEO <clears throat> said to me, imagine that across Europe when you're mm -hmm. trying to deploy. That's very realistic, coming back mm -hmm. to the critical infrastructure. Wow. We know, and you've all seen warnings from, for example, the FBI, that the, U that the Chinese have been implanting malware in our critical infrastructure and leaving it there, Volt Typhoon, to use when there's a crisis. Yeah. So this is just an example of how these lines, I think, are artificial. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and if I can, I don't mean to interrupt. I, I love that example of dropping the, the locks to drop the ship. It, is, I, I hadn't heard that. Because a lot of times when we think about cyber, we think, oh, you know, you're, they're just going to delete information. Uh, and, and that's a, that's a well, not, I was going to say a lovely example, but it's a, it's, it's a horrible way of, of people being clever and saying, all right, I can get this access. What's a wicked thing that I can, that I can do? Oh, yeah. And that, that's, I think, something that we're going to have a cyber champions conference here in a couple of days. And, and that's yeah. one of the reasons I'm here. And that will be a major. Uh, topic of, of discussion. Um, so I think that the real question is what do we do about it yeah. and it's about action and I'll just leave uh, three thoughts and then we can discuss more. One and is... I, and if I can say if you can yeah. start on the what to do about it and then we'll move back uh, move back this way. Mm -hmm. The general already talked a little bit and I'd like to yeah. explore so that. So just three please. points. So I'll do it very yeah, quickly. No, 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 please. One is to uh, recognize that there is uh, one actor using the full range of state tools and by the way, I would just uh, commend anyone to just Google the Russian hybrid command center in Moscow. This, this isn't just us speculating. They proudly showed it off, where all of their instruments of state power are in one place and can be directed against all of us. So uh, recognize that. Second, you have to track patterns and trends, uh, because you can play whack-a-mole. Problem here, a problem there, a problem here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What you have to see is the patterns and trends. And the reason, and that's the third point, uh, part of the reason is you can build resilience in those areas in anticipation. If you know that that's what the exactly. targets are, like critical infrastructure, exactly. then you can build resilience into your system. Uh, and second, and that's the final point, you have to impose costs. Deterrence alone, resilience alone, only invites more attack at an ever higher threshold. And there's a risk of escalation. In NATO, we say we have agreed policy that hybrid attacks can reach the level of invoking our leaders, invoking Article 5, which is our collective defense commitment. Yeah. So we have to deter opponents from escalating to the point where it can become uh, a much higher level uh, of risk. And that means imposing deterrent cost. OK, well, you, you had said you wanted to be specific about it. So I'm, I'm going to press. What's that actually mean? OK, I'll give you a good example. Costs? Like when, when, NATO, when a NATO official gets up and says, we need to impose costs below the level of mm -hmm. kind of warfare. I'll give you a good example. Mean? So um, we have right now in Europe a rising level of sabotage by Russians. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we had that be we've had that before. Uh, and a few years ago, coordinated in NATO, but also outside of NATO, NATO governments took the decision to eject a substantial number of Russian diplomats who were actually intelligence personnel out so that they could no longer conduct the kinds of intelligence activities and intelligence-driven activities which, of which sabotage is one. And that had a clear effect. Sanctions are another way of imposing costs. So there are ways of imposing costs uh, that uh, are felt in the countries that are conducting hybrid warfare against us. Yeah. Um, have we had Article 4 coming together to talk about hybrid? Thomas Ilvis and I wrote a piece in 2017 that we needed to have an Article 4 consultation for election interference. Has, has that happened a lot? So article, can you describe the difference between Article 4 and Article 5? So Article 4 is where uh, a nation that has felt that it is under attack uh, calls for consultations in NATO formal consultations under Article 4 of the Washington Treaty. It is not Article 5, which is one for all and one for, you know, everybody yeah, contributes yeah. to the defense. This yeah. is to signal politically we are very worried, but also to signal politically outside yeah. of NATO, okay, now you're getting too close. Uh, whether or not there has been Article 4 consultations on a specific hybrid threat, I'm not, to be honest, yeah. I'm, I've been around, yeah, but yeah, I don't really yeah. remember. 
Yeah, I'd be curious. I mean, you'd think sabotage and assassination plots might, might cross that line. Um, uh, general, I mean, on specific, I, I love that you already brought up, you know, you had, you had talked about some of the technology that India does and keeping out um, um, some of the technology that you thought was dangerous. Can you expand on that and explore some of these other areas on Absolutely. resilience, please? I think James has brought out some excellent points on, you know, how to counter uh, the warfare, uh, it boils down to resilience, basically. You know, mm. People, process, technologies, and cooperation. I want to insist on the cooperation part. Good, good. Because uh, having been in cyber, I found that, uh, you know, the threat intel that you get from around the world, that really helps. And uh, uh, during the ransomware crisis, I remember there was one particular group uh, uh, where with the help of Interpol and uh, US and NATO, we had actually got inside their system of the criminals who were providing ransomware as a service. And for three months, whenever he attacked anybody, we took out the decryption keys and then gave it to that Great. person. Perfect. Yeah. About $300 million was saved. You know, for three months, we brought him down. That's amazing. So uh, I always insist on international cooperation. Uh, with the help of Australians, we had founded the uh, counter ransomware initiative also. So, uh, but what he said about uh, the Russians having this uh, hybrid command and control center, I think that's, that's a very important point, you know, governance. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, on the other side, you have this adversary who's coordinating everything together on, you know, different vectors that I mentioned. And here we've got these different ministries. And uh, I think the problem would be uh, similar. That has to be countered. So we need, you know, at the national level, uh, some sort of a, mm -hmm. a command and control center and at the sectoral level and different levels. So that, that is something important. Otherwise, uh, I totally agree with him on the deterrence aspect, deterrence by denial, deterrence by punishment. And in cyber, uh, let me share with you, it takes time. It's not easy. You have to be sitting there, you know, right? And that is where persistence matters. So it's, it's a tough game. But uh, you have to send the signal across that, boy, you do something and you get a bloody nose. <laughs> Yeah, it, um, thank you for that. You know, as I was thinking about, you know, the Russian organization, which you, which you talked about, it reminded me of the, I think it's the Swedes that have their psychological defense mm -hmm. agency, which is such a unique concept, especially to an American. And I wonder, I don't think there are many societies that, that have built such a thing to look at so specifically at psychological Absolutely. defense and, and resilience. Uh, can I ask you to expand um, just a little bit on uh, Indian technology, like in 5G and you know, dealing with Huawei and dealing with TikTok. Can I, can I ex mm -hmm. ask you to just expand on that a little bit before we go to the minister? So we were the first ones to start banning the apps. You know, 2020, we banned about 50 apps and uh, apps and uh, TikTok was one of them. And the reason was that, uh, you know, when we found that in our tier two and three cities, especially, yeah. you know, there's a, they had a market of uh, 20 to 30 crore users and, uh, after every 10 videos, we found, you know, one video where something was being propagated. Hmm. That's when he realized that, you know, it's, it's not social media. There's a national security issue here. Mm -hmm. So we started, we were the first ones to back. And then uh, uh, as far as data thefts was concerned, you know, then these stories started coming out. I wonder if you um, uh, recall the, uh, the Chinese company called the Zenua Data IT company. And that had data of about uh, 10,000 Americans, 10,000 Indians, 10,000 Australians and uh, uh, including criminals and politicians and mm -hmm. prominent people. Mm -hmm. And if you go to their portal, they were openly advertising that they collect data from open source to help the military intelligence, mm -hmm. right? So when these sort of things came out, we realized that they had to be kept out of 5G. And that's wow. when we, on 16th of December, 2021, we invoked the National Security Directive on the telecom sector, which is what I spoke of last time that mm -hmm. we said that only trusted products from trusted sources. Mm -hmm. I was the designated authority to classify as to what is a trusted source and trusted this thing. And we, in, in, in product also, we went down to the active semiconductors, the silicon, as to where are the chips coming from, which is a bit difficult today. Let me tell you, the supply chain cannot be changed overnight. Yeah. So it's, it's difficult. So we accepted something. We could, didn't accept something else. But we uh, ensured that you know, we had only trusted uh, equipment in our telecom networks. So technology, yes, it's, it's, it's very important what we've discussing since the morning as to, uh, uh, in fact, there's an ASPI report of about 50 mm -hmm. technologies which says that, you know, right. 25 of them, the Chinese are leading or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is the ASPI Tech Tracker yeah. report, which mm -hmm. just came out um, last week, um, I think Wednesday night, um, Australia time. So, so do check it out. Um, and I'm sure they have copies and they'll be speaking about it 
out here. It was really excellent. Oh, and um, also submarine cables. I, I, I think um, um, submarine cables came up, and they're, they've got a great um, submarine cable report, which is going to be coming out um, soon from ASPE. Mr. I'm going to kind of uh, talk about here on, on resilience. And then if you want to start catching my eye for hands, then we'll start, we'll start getting questions. Please, ma'am. So what to do? I will, I will concentrate on, on our take on what to do. I think first know the, uh, the state actors, non-state actors, ultimate objective and the playbook. And it's different, Russia to China and other countries. So depending where you are and, and what is the objective. But you need to know that. And you need also to clearly explain that to the key people in your uh, government, non-governmental sectors, key journalists, key opinion makers, and so on and so forth. It's essential that they understand. In Russian case, the playbook is pretty straightforward. It's the polarizing of the of the groups in society by active measures and info ops and hostile information operations. Again, success rate is not necessarily very high, mm -hmm. but that is something that they try. Uh, second, uh, try to, uh, once you have polarized those groups, try to get those groups in favor of your objectives in that particular society. Uh, you can use various means, whether that's you know family, values or you mm. can use Christianity or uh, uh, Islamic violence, you know, they can be dip differing on, on uh, where you are. So those, those uh, sort of mobilizing measures can be different. Uh, and the countermeasures are pretty straightforward. I mean, the elite captures mostly uh, happen through human, uh, through uh, old sort of straightforward matters. And that's why the uh, degrading of the Russian uh, human network in the European countries and in other countries has been so essential. Uh, throwing out people under diplomatic support who were not diplomats, uh, diplomatic cover, uh, basically used for other activities. So degrading the presence in our countries of Russian activities has been crucial. Uh, that ch had to change the operation, so they are now trying to use more of the uh, online networks, uh, social media platforms, Telegram and so on, for uh, trying to hire people with various backgrounds, addicts, uh, um, criminals, to make sure that they can do some small sabotage operations and so on and so forth. Um, so, so those classical methods that have been in operation for decades yeah. and decades are still active. And that's why when we discuss also the further degrading of, the, uh, in this case, Russian networks in our countries, it's for our own security. It's not because yeah. we don't like you know, a particular person or this and that. But it's really to degrade the, the ability to uh, contract. Strengthening our own counterintelligence, strengthening our own uh, services, uh, very cl clear dialogue and cooperation with like-minded states, but also with other states. Uh, we learn a great deal from Indians, from Australians, from others mm -hmm. on, on how they work, how they operate, what is happening in those countries. So that's why this constant, constant engagement and cooperation is so crucial. And within NATO, actually, the investment in uh, Intel Services Cooperation, creating the Joint Intelligence Security Division, uh, which draws together all 32 allied services for joint threat assessment, for joint uh, counteraction, has been crucial in also achieving concrete action, which is investment in early warning to understand the other side to understand uh, what operations uh, are happening, both in military and non-military terms, to understand what works, what movements are there, what uh, is the reliance on satellites or in other uh, type of, of tech uh, in the operations. So this is, this is I think, uh, something that uh, we have to recognize. Also the fact that Russians have tried to mobilize the rest of the world against the EU and NATO and Ukraine and others by uh, various activities, not only Wagner Group's activities, but actually trying to capture elites in, in other countries in a very direct way. So here for us, I think uh, the important part is to be really 
uh, genuinely involved in international affairs and yeah. genuinely worked with the countries, whether that's Africa or the Pacific or elsewhere. They have their own interests, they have their own policies, uh, so it's crucially important. And as for Ukraine, let's not forget, for two and a half years, in violation of any UN basic article, there's a nuclear armed state attacking a neighbor. I mean, it's simple as that. If we let that succeed, I'm sorry, forget Indian security, any other security will be under threat. So it's, it's simple as that. So the war is not over, it's a long war, and we all have stakes in it not to succeed. Thank you for bringing us back to that. Um, there was just so much there. I love that you hit the, the early warning uh, because, again, one of my concerns is that we get used to the hybrid threats being used as a substitute for military action. But as we've seen, it can also be the prelude to military action. And if we mistake that moment, um, then we're going to get hit with something. I had a conversation with Justin Bassey there saying we've, we, we've gotten used to this. We've kind of gotten used to shrugging it off and that only not allows them to, to make their gains and split our split societies um, and achieve their national security purposes. Um, but it, it means they, can, they might decide that they want to try and get away with a little bit more. So I really, I really appreciate that point. And, and just to highlight, right, in, in case, uh, to, to summarize what we came across here, right, when we said specifically what do we do about it, right, it was, it was something that the, the, the virtual speaker in the last panel said, we can't just have leadership by blog, which I thought was a lovely point. And a lot of times, it can feel that way about hybrid threats. Right? It can feel like, great, someone else is writing a, a piece about this. But we have these really strong things. Right? Aspie is, is looking to say, All right, can we set up an Asia Pacific Center or Indo Pacific Center to help share about these threats, which you had mentioned about? We talked about imposing costs. We've talked about different ways to build societal resilience, like explain to key members of the population, like look at the objectives and the shared, and the shared values and the ways that we can talk about But also about actual this. investment in both critical infrastructure, mm -hmm. in skills, in staffs, mm -hmm. in knowledge, in cooperation. It yeah. has to be an actual yeah. investment. You can't just talk about it. Yeah. You know, have to devote resources and, to it. And sometimes it's a looking at a technology, yeah. like Absolutely. saying, all right, we're going to keep out a particular provider of technology that we don't like, like 5G um, or the rest, uh, like the general mentioned. And other time, you know, it's, it's building up our counterintelligence, right? So I really like this panel. We ask them to be specific um, with region, you know, with perspectives from across regions, and, that, and that's what they delivered. Um, and so moving on from that, um, we have um, almost 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, thank you, everyone, for having such great comments and keeping it and keeping Everybody it short. Everybody's depressed. Let's start. Let's start like, oh, we're not as bad as the AI panel. We're still okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, yes, uh, we, I have one over here. I have one over here. Uh, thank you. My name is John Darren. West from the Asian Century Institute. Uh, my understanding is that when it comes to AI and to other advanced technologies, there's really two players in the world. There's the US and there's China, and that uh, Europe is way behind. And since we have a European uh, minister on the panel, I'd like to have a <laughs> uh, perspective from her on whether Europe really is behind, and, and if it is behind, how Europe can lift itself to be a, a big player along with the, the US and China. Because we share values with Europeans, we need your strength also in the international system. And, and I think also if we hear that from uh AI, and, I mean, from India, from others, ma'am? I will tend to argue not that Europe is not behind. At least what we are seeing currently uh, happening in Ukraine is that those are very much the European companies being on the ground there. I mean, there are companies yeah, from, from other parts of the world also. But they, because of those aspects of electronic warfare that we discussed before, you actually need to be on the ground there to be able to deal with the challenges uh, provided by the Russian electronic warfare. You can't just move, you know, whether it's drones or other equipment back and forth constantly across the borders to reprogram it every 10 days, 12 uh, days or, or two weeks. So there is a lot of experimentation assessment and adjustment happening as we speak, mostly done by Europeans. Uh, uh, I mean, Ukrainians is Euro are Europeans, no? And, and, but also others, Finns, Latvians, Estonians, quite a number of others. 
And uh, that's, that sort of uh, development, I think, is such a huge jump in both tech. I think it's not incremental. I think it's actually pretty revolutionary where you see low-cost uh, platforms taking down much more expensive and, and advanced type of stuff. So uh, it involves everything that you can possibly think of, the so reliance on satellites or reliance on mobile or reliance on other connections, enablement, uh, the human skills. Uh, so there, um, I do think that Europe will have an advantage in a, in a wider sense. Obviously, the, in terms of regulation, the European, the EU's AI Act, from one hand, companies complain that they are being constrained, uh, that it's not uh, do what you want everywhere. From other hand, they see it as something that at least provides some certain framework. Okay. That it's a base, again, that will probably become more and more global, that allows to experiment on the basis of some rules. So that is, um, I think, the approach Europe has taken. Uh, in the same time, ensuring that, I think, the, the real issue will be AI and defense. Mm -hmm how you change defense procurement. And I'm sure J James can talk more about the efforts in, in NATO, which have been there for the, since before the war started. Because uh, incrementally, sort of the development of AI for defense is very difficult with the current procurement roles. Mm -hmm. You need safe spaces, safe computing spaces for smaller SMEs who can experiment in those safe spaces. We can call them sandboxes, I don't care what they call. We need that ability for them to work alongside this innovation ecosystem, to work alongside the traditional defense companies to be able again uh, in, a, in an agile way to develop stuff. But uh, that is something that we had to get right. And, and I think at least in Europe on a smaller scale in our countries that are smaller, agile, tech advanced, we are doing that. In Latvia, we are hosting the only 5G military test bed in the um, whole of European continent, uh, oh, wow. and, and that is where multi-domain operations are tested oh, nice. as we speak. Great. So the next big thing is in October, and, and yeah, those yeah. These are challenges that we are just uh, General, Deputy S Secretary General, <coughs> any, anything additional? Um, yeah, a couple of things. I, I think maybe I'll qualify uh, what the foreign minister said. So everything uh, that Baba said is absolutely correct. There's a huge amount of innovation in Europe, but it is also the case that the money is in the US and to mm -hmm. a lesser extent in the UK. Uh, so, yeah. you know, Mistral AI, this French company, gets a lot of uh, attention. I think there's a couple of other slightly smaller AI companies, but if you compare to the amount of investment that's taking place in the United States, and as I say, to a lesser mm -hmm. extent in the UK, it does dwarf what's in Europe. And uh, the challenge with AI is that basically these models need a huge amount of money. And so the big companies have a massive advantage uh, yeah. when it comes to this. So I think one of the solutions uh, in Europe is uh, venture capital. Uh, we have created at NATO a uh, deep, tech and deep tech innovation fund. It's oh, a great. billion euros now. It's about wow. to go up, I think, to a billion and a half in the coming months. And, and we hope annually? To, uh, annually? No, over a 15 year period. Okay. But we're keep, we keep yeah, adding, great, so that's where great, it is great. now. Yeah. Um, and we estimate that with every euro that we're investing, we're crowding in somewhere between 10 to 15 euros. So if you're up at about 15 billion to yeah. 20, then you're right. getting somewhere. And we're trying to sort of help European companies uh, get over the, the sort of death valley of yeah, investment yeah, and, and, and invest long term. But Baiba's point about um, rapid adoption is really important. So we got a, a tasking out of the Washington summit a few weeks ago, or a couple months ago now, to in one year develop a rapid adoption strategy for innovation in NATO. Because if mm. you followed every NATO procedure perfectly to acquire new technology, which we don't, every innovative technology would be obsolete by the time we, right. uh, we developed it because AI models are being updated, you know, yep. as Eric Schmidt yep. said, every six months, sometimes every, every three months. Uh, so that doesn't work. Uh, so we have a whole st set of steps in place to be able to acquire technology much, much more quickly, but it is a massive challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. 
we can go into detail if yeah. you want about how to do it's it. It's not for one ideas. military, but you know, trying to do that across 30. So one thought well, that I had was actually, for, to, to what James said, that I think for the governments it would be important to not so much for the AI in defense to orientate themselves on buying software or buying you know, AI models, but actually supporting developers for longer terms, the smaller mm -hmm. innovation ecosystems yeah. to make sure that they have that reliability of, of money and support yeah. uh, to come back mm -hmm. and, and develop something. There'll be a lot of waste, but there will be returns. Yeah, yeah. General, any, anything additional? Yeah, I mean, uh, within the Quad, with uh, the US, Australia, and Japan, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, the critical and emerging technologies dialogue. One of the lines of effort is that, and within that, uh, a lot of work is being done. As you're aware, uh, India has always been in the forefront of uh, software development, right, since the Y2K days. Uh, most of the R&D centers of all the biggest IT companies are there in India. Uh, we've recently launched a multi-billion dollar uh, India AI machine. Mm. where uh, about 60% of that is going into the compute part, you know, the H100 mm -hmm. right, right, NVIDIA right. GPUs. So mm -hmm. we're building up the nationwide compute facility and then of course the application will come. So a lot, of, lot, lot, lot is happening from the India front. But with Australia, I can assure you that uh, both within the Quad as well as in our bilateral strategic uh, partnerships, there is some work going on on, on this aspect. Yeah, and just because we're on hybrid, um, it also strikes me on I'd like to see more capability outside the United States on attribution, mm -hmm. um, because if we mm -hmm. want to call out cyber or, in fact, misinformation threats, so many of the companies that do that are, are, are American or they are, you know, you're relying on American intelligence or a small set of other uh, mostly European companies or intelligence agencies. And I think we need to see that a little bit more distributed. Thank you for your patience here. Hi, my name is Karish Kaur, and my question is uh, to the panel particularly on hybrid warfare. Now, when India faced hybrid warfare from China, we banned 150 Chinese apps, including TikTok. Uh, and we have seen recently United States doing the same, uh, banning companies like Kaspersky. But when it comes to EU and NATO, we haven't seen such uh, applications being used. So one side, we are definitely trying to corner Russia, but at the other side, we are using the Russian tech. And these companies are now moving away from uh, U.S. and setting up bases in NATO countries which are not strongly aligned with the NATO value. So want to get your thoughts on this. Great. Great question. I think that's for a foreign minister to answer. <laughs> <laughs> the diplomat <Savvy>. <laughs> um, Again, it depends on, on what we are talking about. On the Russian information operations, quite clearly there has been a ban on the stations, on the apps, on, on a variety of different uh, uh, sources, both and outlets that Russia uses. Um, the uh, sanctions list is quite wide, also with respect to various Russian companies. Uh, Tech, non-tech, geotech, it's, it's, uh, when you look at it, it's huge. And there is also a prohibition of the EU companies in the third countries and their daughter companies and franchise operations to do the same. So uh, it's, it's not about so much the applications per se, but actually the ones that commit uh, actions uh, against against the EU, against Ukraine, and so on and so forth. On uh, on the approach to TikTok, uh, on the approach to other uh, applications, the European Commission is in lead, and that's a very specific animal for the EU that uh, we prefer because it's a common market of 500 million. So you cannot do the guacamole games that in one country you do that because they will just, just move uh, elsewhere. So we do that across the market and it's the commission that is in lead and they use various methods. They use the carrots, they use the whips, they use um, the variety of, of angles to achieve the outcome. Uh, the uh, sort of telegram development was a, a surprise, uh, I think for a number of countries. Uh, the French authorities arresting uh, the owner. But we knew that there was a problem because there was a real sincere lack of cooperation by the uh, telegram owners on anything, 
on anything, the refusal to have a contact. And that was at the commission level, that was at the national authority level. So it was just a matter of time uh, when, when uh, this was going to happen. So again, uh, taking measures, making decisions, depending on what and how and where to achieve the objective. The current objective is very clear. Our priority is degrading Russian military capability, both yes. to conduct military operations in Ukraine, but also to return to significant presence at our borders. So, and for that, there is a whole toolbox that is being used. Uh, reducing the price of oil, going after the uh, so-called uh, shadow fleet uh, vessels transporting mm -hmm. illegal Russian oil and so on and so forth, sanctions. Uh, but again, sanctions as a tool is a very particular target uh, to, to degrade Russian capabilities. China is, a, China is a big challenge because it does enable Russia's war in Ukraine. And uh, it does not supply military equipment, at least uh, we still uh, do not have confirmation from our intel people that it happens. But in all the other technological aspects and elsewhere, uh, China is not uh, on the right side. So there is a robust dialogue with the Chinese authorities about it. I've got a, tech, uh, I've got a technical question for, for either two of you, because we've talked about banning apps here, and I'm, and I'm sure my Columbia colleague Maria Ress is going to talk a little bit more about banning apps and in, in in similar issues. Um, I know when we do sanctions on, for example, on companies or shadow fleets, they just create another another company and it just go and it and it squirts off into another direction. Does that happen with apps? Like when, when you ban an app, does it generally stay out because it's that app? It has to have that name, or does it pop up again in other in other places? I, I assume it's the first, but I'm not. Do either of you have experience? It pops up again. It does. Okay. There's a later version that comes up. It comes up by a different name. Okay. I mean, they get uh, registered in, you know, somewhere else in Vietnam or somewhere like that. So it's, okay. you go to, it's a continuous process. All right, mm -hmm. so it is a continuous process. Okay. Um, and something that struck me, I know, on the U.S. side is that we were very, you know, we, we like to ban the apps, but we don't actually, we're not very clear why we're doing it, and we don't look at the other areas. You know, we, we ban an app, and then, but, but adversaries could just buy the information through data brokers because we have the data broker markets completely unregulated so they can pop in. One of our Columbia colleagues, Camille Francois, has been really clear in disinformation of talking about the ABCs. And this was done for misinformation, but it's valid here as well. Are you worried about the actor? And it mm. doesn't matter anything else because that actor is bad, in this case, Russian military. Is it the behavior? We don't care who's doing it, but this, per this actor is doing something bad and we want to stop it, or is it the content? Uh, child sexual abuse material, um, um, election denying, um, or the rest, and the other two things, it's just what's being said that you care about. And so I thought that was a great model, ABC, um, to help think about, and she had developed that for misinformation, which is now used by the trust and safety teams through the world, but I thought that was a useful thing to help us be, to be better on the policy making and our conversations. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I don't see any other, so I think we've got um, to close out. Any, any final comments? Sorry to depress you all. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> okay. Yay, hybrid warfare. It's okay. There's light outside. Yep. I mean, is there like, like so like, let's, let's finish. We've got two minutes. Let's, let's, are there positive areas, right? I mean, democracies must have strengths in these areas. We're having these kinds of conversations. Uh, Absolutely. Maybe some, some and and the companies are flourishing. Uh, the Russians are not being successful mm -hmm. in, our com in our countries. There is a uh, clear understanding of what China is doing, thanks also to, to close engagements with partners uh, all around the world. Uh, I, we all believe in our democratic values. I mean, that we don't have to be organized in the same way, but in the same time, mm. we do believe that there has to be a certain uh, law-based order uh, among the countries, within countries, that is based on certain values. So I think it's, it's overall, we are okay, but we can't mm -hmm. relax. And in that respect, it's great to have uh, dialogues like these where it's not the same group think as always. In Europe, we tend to be very naval uh, gazing Europeans, <laughs> and that's not very helpful. So there has to be a conscious effort to gather and to get things in and to change our thinking, both cross-sectoral, private, public, 
uh, different mm -hmm. continents, different leaderships, and, and without uh, constraints, without any type of pre-judgment of what we're going to hear. Yeah, My mind goes back to that question in the morning of autocracy versus democracy. Yes. So here we have, uh, you know, uh, somebody who's applying his entire state power. He's got the Cyberspace Administration. He's got the Central Military Commission. And here we are, you know, segregated. So how, how do, that is a challenge. How do, how do we put in a whole of nation approach to counter the hybrid threat? I think that is a challenge that all of us need to understand, and yeah. find a model to counter it. Yeah. Deputy Secretary General. Uh, two things. One is I agree with Baiba, we're not doing so badly. Um, we built up resilience across almost every sector and it yeah. works pretty well. But the, I think if there's a takeaway we haven't discussed is that we need a fundamental, and so things we can do, which is a much deeper public-private partnership in every mm -hmm. one of these sectors. Mm -hmm. Tech firms run the networks. They know what's going on. They can work with us. Uh, we can work much closer with media companies and with the platforms. Some of them resist, some of them don't. We've set up a uh, critical undersea energy uh, infrastructure network with the energy companies that would have never dreamed of talking to NATO two years ago. Now we talk to them every day. We have yeah. exchange of sensor data. Uh, so we can do this, but companies now need to get into the game with us. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. only way this works for them to have the, uh, the markets and the societies they want to live in is they need to work with us. And we want to work with them according to our shared values and to defend our shared values. Um, on that, the, um, in the, the US venture capital firms uh, led by Paladin um, have come together with a list of you're out of time, so they yeah, shut off your right. microphone. Um, uh, there is a, <laughs> <laughs> they gave you a code of conduct of what they're going to invest in. It includes the national security. Um, please join in thanking. We heard great practical things. So thank you to the panel.